You're welcome back. Um, this is still the run-up. As it stands, Atiku, Tinubu and Obi, who are the leading candidates in the February 25 presidential election, have one corruption allegation or the other leveled against them. And Nigerians, uh, who are the voters, may have no choice but to choose one of them, uh, which uh, uh, some people will say uh, between the devil and the deep blue sea, <laughs> or a lesser evil. With no debt, uh, while no debt has been dug up against the presidential candidate of the new Nigeria People's Party, uh, Dr. Rabio Kwanko, so who people say is uh, uh, the fourth person who is leading in this race. The former governor of Kanu State, however, does not enjoy the nationwide acceptance like the three others. Recently, there had been accusations and counter accusations of, between the APC, PDP, and LP over alleged corruption of their principles. The Presidential Campaign Council of APC threw the first punch when it asked security agencies in the country to invite, arrest, interrogate, and prosecute Atiku Abubakar over what the party described as Atiku Gate. Joining us to discuss this are Omoshola Deji, political scientist, and Mr. Charles Otu, political analyst as well. Uh, gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the roundup. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Okay, uh, we were hoping that this 2023 elections and the campaigns especially will be issue-based more than anything else. And now we're seeing a semblance of what has always happened in the other years and may maybe even more bitter because it seems as if some of the candidates that are in the race are very, very desperate. From one camp to the other, even though it's not from pr presidential candidates themselves, but their lieutenants are the ones that are throwing punches left, right and center. And we're wondering, uh, should these people even be in the race anymore? What can be done to curtail these vituperations, if I may use the words, to curtail this kind of unhealthy banter? Because according to some Nigerians, this is very unhealthy. We should be talking of something else. So what are your suggestions to, to clip the wings of these people who talk too much, as it were? <laughs> Let me begin with you, Mr. Otu. Thank you very much. Uh, so I the situation in uh, Nigeria today, um, like you pointed out, uh, there are no sins. And um, because politics itself, like political scientists would tell us, is conflict. Uh, part of what is going on is always part of the political process. You, you, you must have heard, of course, during the debates in the US between Trump and um, Biden. They were also throwing a punch, so it is not unexpected in politics. But the, the, the truth is that um, part of what has kept this presidential election interesting and intriguing is the fact that the candidates have had equal opportunities. We've gravitated from an era where people used to buy cars along the road from the car seller. And that's around with the people eat uh, delicacies like uh, along the road to show their stability. I'm happy that we are not talking about issues. I'm also happy that um, the two presidential candidates, front runners, are on each other's uh, juggler. So, as it were, for the first time, we are talking about issues, issues that pertain to corruption as well, and other issues that concern Nigerians, the rest of Nigerians. So for me, it is all part of what political analysts and scientists will tell us that politics itself is conflict, and these conflicts are not unexpected. So, but for the voters, uh, the electorates, the people that they are meeting on the campaign grounds, uh, some of us, however, expected uh, a more tactical engagement. Just like when these front runners, the four front runners, were in the Shatam House. We expected a scenario where these candidates will speak basically on these allegations, you know, some of these allegations to clear the air to the world, to the global community and them. But that didn't happen. And uh, it was for the simple reason that the Nigerian electorates have not matured to the extent of engaging them on these issues. Uh, we we'll, we'll talk about Article Gate. You we heard about Kayamo filing a suit against Atiku and all of that. All this, for me, are uh, mere distractions. The candidates should be looked at from the perspectives of 
the offices they have occupied in the past, they have been all governor at some point, except Atiku, who was the vice president for eight years. They have all occupied political offices at some point. What are the antecedents these persons have left, these uh, individuals have left in office? What are their records in terms of treatment of civil servants in their states, in terms of infrastructure development, in terms of security, in terms of keeping to their promises and keeping to their words? This should have been the areas we expected the electorates to engage them as they go about campaigning. But you know, the Nigerian public debate, Mr. Wangun, as it were, people, it's more of a um, noise. People are eager to see crowds sharing, people sharing the candidates and saying, oh, you are the best because we are here. And we are here basically not saying it, but implying it to get our own share of your legis. So as it were, uh, you can give this uh, election about 40-50% um, pass mark in terms of, you know, focusing on it as it were, over and above what was in the past, where it was just you get into the market, as you're buying the vegetable from the woman, the cameras are on you, you don't even say anything. So it's even because the dynamics have changed, and it's changed because of is in the race. That is why we are talking about these two parties, the frontliners, that the two major parties, <coughs> APC and PDP, being on each other's juggler, as it were. We're talking about, uh, uh, you know, corruptions and exposing themselves and all of that. So, uh, for me, whether those allegations, like some people are saying, is substantiated or not, Nigeria should be asking questions about those allegations. Because for me, it's also more of whistleblowing. It's also more of, uh, it's also good, they are telling us about who they were, who have been in the past, things that were not known about them. So Nigeria should engage them on these issues and robustly bring them to, 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 to table within the next three weeks or so before the presidential election. So we don't end up electing a president who will be so distracted by his past. That is my submission, Mr. Wangu. Yeah, Deji, how about you? What's your take? I think the issues raised in the allegations against the APC presidential candidate at that for the PDP are serious fundamental issues that put both of them in bad light if Nigeria were to be a same country. Having said that, this um, calumny campaign, which is now at its peak, I think it is a strategy for the candidates to demarcate their or disqualify their opponent. But if you look at Nigerian political trend, uh, we have vote buying. Vote buying may not fly if CBN insists on the Naira design. Now, if you look at the Nigerian um, political trend, again, we have a series of issues, vote buying, Tongri, rigging of elections, which has been badly addressed by the people system. So the question now comes to the mind of the politicians, that what can we do to demarket our opponent, to disqualify our opponent, to make our opponent look bad? Because if we don't have enough money to bribe, the electorate, then we need to work on their mindset to make them see our opponent as not credible. And that is why you can see that, like never before, calumny campaign, close to the election, now it's at its peak. The politicians have adopted this strategy. Every election season, every election cycle comes with its own strategy based on the instrument that is available to the politicians. But I think that using calumny campaign will not be of benefit to either of the political parties based on the mindset of the electorate that we are. Largely, Nigerians um, are not moved anymore by all these allegations because some of them have been repeated over time. And if you look at the, the candidates themselves, the, the allegations that have been put forward has always lived with them for decades or more. 
if you talk about um, name issue, if you talk about drug issue, certificate issue, corruption, these are not new issues. So Nigerians have been used to it. When things nearly happen, when something is changed, it is normal to expect clamor from Nigerians. Like when the headsmen and bandits, when they first started ravaging communities and killing people, there were clamor from Nigerians. Everybody was scared, everybody was happy. But now, even if, even if they hear that bandit overrun a community, nobody is talking because the psychology of the people have been configured to live with it. So the psychology of Nigerians have been configured to live with all these allegations. They hear it every time, they see it every time. And that's, and that's why you will see that, as one would have expected in thinner times, there is no much protest from the public. So even if you come out today and say social so candidate has stolen trillions, so social so candidate has Nigeria in his pocket, you won't get much reaction from Nigeria. That shows that it has become like a political culture. It is something that people expect to hear, and they are not reacting the way they should be. But if, if I'm to move to the specifics, I think the APC camp, or progressive funded camp, firing the first bullet, it is a strategy by his um, campaign council, in the sense that before you fire a bullet, it would have been better to look at the quality of your candidate, to look at the antecedent of your candidate, and think, this action that I'm about to take, is it going to be favorable to my candidate? But when your candidate has a lot of baggage issues, and at the end of the day, you are firing a bullet, then Weiss is the one who said, who you lives in a glass house, do not choose stone. So did the APC to have told the first stone, of course, and they have a candidate that has a lot of baggage in the city, they should have naturally expect that the PDP is going to re respond in equal measure, which the PDP has done. But what will come out of it, will it influence the um, outcome of election? I don't think so. Why? Because we have citizens that are docile. We have a lot of disoriented citizens whose minds have been configured to think that, okay, um, you can do anything and Get away with you. We have a citizens when we have citizens whose mind have been configured with it and so perspective. Somebody stole money and so somebody doesn't have a certificate and so. So in that kind of time, you, you, you won't expect much to come from the calumni campaign as we have it now. And if it doesn't work, as we move closer to the election, you should expect some form of new approach, new strategy from the politicians if the calumni campaign does not work as expected. All right, but, but it, one thing I picked from, you know, the submissions made by the both of you is that, first of all, it is expected uh, during uh, uh, elections that, you know, there will be back and forth and people throwing shades at each other. And, of course, that it has become more like a political tradition in Nigeria, you know, for the electorate or the masses to be docile and not ask questions. But then, where is the place of accountability? If you go to Sena Climbs, the, the mere fact that you know, such uh, an allegation is smeared on your name, you would see people resigning, saying they are stepping down. You would see relevant organizations coming out to do uh, proper investigations. You would see political parties withdrawing their candidates. I mean, this is what happens in a, in a, in a city, in, in, a, in, a, in a nation, where things work properly. And that brings me back to my question. Where is the place of accountability? None of these allegations are, can be said to be little. I mean, uh, Atiku has been accused of, you know, between 1999 to 2007, opening a separate account with his then um, um, principal, uh, former president, Olusegun Obasanjo, uh, the LP pres presidential candidate, Labour Party, Peter Obi, has been accused of, you know, douching some billions of naira to a, a company owned by his family, you know, the owners of Hero Beer and all that. And of course, the, the drug um, 
allegation against the Ashiwaju Bola Tinubu of the APC. These are not small accusations. So where is the place of accountability? Are they even supposed to be allowed to still be in this race? Where is it? Is it even constitutional? Is there, is there a place in the constitution that says, if you have such a baggage, you are not allowed to vie? This is my question. And I, I'm, I'm directing it to you, Mr. Charles. Thank you very much. Our institutions have become the greatest apparatus we've heard. I listened to the political scientist in the studio. The, all he stated are very correct as well. The Nigerians have become so used, so accustomed, it has become their, pass, their passiveness and their docility to issues that you bother them has become a concern. But then, you put it back to the institutions. We talked about the bullion van in 2019 elections. Tinubu distributing money on election day with bullion vans in Lagos. Pictures were there, a suit where was filed, a petition was made to EFCC. Why was this matter not investigated four years after? The answer is simple, weak institutions. Can the EFCC chairman bring these three presidential candidates to book and set up a special crack for to investigate what happens across the nations of the world where things work properly. By now, civil society organizations, civil liberty groups should have been besieging the national headquarters of these parties, asking them to withdraw their candidates, to drop their candidates and bring fresh candidates, or at best, be out of the race. But that is not going to happen. So, like uh, my colleague said, we become so accustomed to it that people will prefer to say, okay, let's go for the lesser evil. None of them is, is, is right in this. Somebody was trying to justify why Peter B of the Liberal Party must have a foreign account. Why it is not a, a case of corruption for him to have foreign accounts and then do because uh, you want some money in Nigeria, the financial institutions will frustrate you based on the volume of business it does and all of that. I said, these are all systemic failures. They are all systemic, they are all institutional failures. So uh, the, the place of accountability is such that, or, or lack of accountability is such that as the governors are going out, they are not going to declare their assets as their living office. They have amassed so much wealth. As this, the people that are angry to take over from them are coming in, they are also not going to declare their assets. And there is nobody in this country who is serious about running election and spending money that has not stolen from the government coffers one way or the other. Those who have not stolen are not even liked by the people. Because they say people have a governorship candidate in their boy, for instance, who is liked, who has been for the masses. And you will see some, some voters who will tell you yes, that he is good, though, but he doesn't have money. You ask them, where do you expect him to get the money from to spend? Where, do, where were you expecting? He hasn't stolen from government. Well, so they expect that you should also use seize the opportunity you have to steal. So that is why these presidential candidates can move about with these allegations. They are turning across the six geopolitical zones, statistics on the FCT, campaigning freely and willingly without when they should have been facing the, the panels that should be quizzing them. Okay, we seem to have okay. Okay. Oh. Sir? Uh, well, gentlemen, gentlemen, just just a moment. Um, uh, we will we will take a short break and return to deal with other issues. For instance, all of you have have spoken well about um, the fact that uh, delegations are coming, but uh, Nigerians, according to Deji, uh, the mindset of Nigerians. Uh, has been such that they are used to it. We need to address that because the crux of the matter is they say leaders come from the people. And if we are good enough, they, then we will have good leaders. If we ask the right questions, then they will sit up. They we're talking about accountability. It is we that will hold them accountable. But where do we start to address these issues? Those are the things that we will look at when we return from this break. Stay with us. Thank you. I think his network broke or something. The camera has issues, mm -hmm. that's why it's always like that. We'll go to, we'll go to DG. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Scroll to their names again, please. Is this okay? Omoshola Teji. Teji, yes. Leave mm. Omoshola just. And that's Charles Otu, not out. I know. <laughs> I know. I would have been so confused because, like, I'm so glad you're the person that took it. <laughs> it has done that a lot to me. In in my state, there's a place. There's a lot of Otu. And once you type it in the computer, it turns to out. You get so, so, and for somebody like me, that is not yes, yeah, we're good. For somebody like me, that is not used to that type of me, I go draw the reason. Waiting with this, just <laughs> out. I said, how is he American? <laughs> now them they answer all these kind of names. <laughs> See somebody say his name is Stone. Yeah. When we come back, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gotters, Jay, your name is Gotta. I said, we are the ones that kill ourselves and say, what's the meaning of your name? Like, like it will change your life or something. Nothing. Hey, it's superstition. They believe your name There's has... bush. There's tree. There's, <laughs> there's winter bottom. There is, <laughs> there's no name we have not seen. Yes. There's even Bulaba. <laughs> He's laughing. <laughs> Charles, not lie. He's not in line. No. <laughs> The computer wrote your name, Charles, out. <laughs> I'm sure it has done that to you a lot of times. <laughs> oh, God. There, there is this... Um... To... Okay, yeah, that's cool. <coughs> There's that's this really post nice. on social media where they wrote... <laughs> Down. Hall. Bula. <laughs> Bala Blue. Bala Blue. Bula oh, Bala. Seven, Nigeria, six, so. five, <laughs> four, three, two, one. You're welcome back. It's still the run-up. Uh, even though uh, somebody in one of the campaign councils will not agree, or uh, one contestant rather, will not even agree that it's a, a, an Olympic that uh, the people are contesting to go and do, mm -hmm. uh, but we will still call it a political Olympic that is coming up. It, in, in the first place, it comes every four years, mm -hmm. and some people that go there very young come out very old because <laughs> the stress is so much. Yeah. So it's as stressful as running a 100-meter race uh, in those four years that you're going to be there. So whether we like it or not, it takes a lot of strength to be able to govern a people of so much diversity as this Nigeria that we find ourselves. What we were talking about the accusations and counter accusations that are going on between uh, the lieutenants of these political um, or these candidates, the front runners especially, we're talking about um, the All Progressives Congress. Bola Tinobu is the candidate. Uh, Alhaja Tikwa Bubaka is the one for PDP. We have the one for LP or Labour Party, that is Peter Obi. We also have uh, another one who is also uh, strong, at least stronger than the rest <laughs> or that we have not mentioned here in so many quarters, that is Rabiu Kwankwaso. So everybody's trying to mudsling and make sure that the other one is painted. But in the course of our talking with our guest, Charles Otu and uh, Omoshola uh, Deji, one thing came up that the people, we are a docile people. Mm -hmm. not, maybe not necessarily gullible, but docile. We don't want to act on things that, uh, in fact, when you hear this person is a thief, you say, yes, leave him. He's our own thief. It's our <laughs> turn to steal and all that. But let me come to you, Deji. Since you made that point first, um, it, the worrisome thing is that if we don't change that mindset that you see Nigerians now have, then we'll keep repeating the same mistakes and being inside this kind of problem that we are finding ourselves. Where do we start from to address this issue of a different mindset that will make our leaders stand on their toes, that will make our people make the right choices and all that? Where do we start to address this problem? I think we can start to address the problem from two perspectives. Number one, from the angle of the institution of the state. Number two, from the citizen. First, from the institution of the state, if somebody has been in a political office and has been the vice president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and has left office since 2007, coming up with such allegations against him. Now, 
with pure evidence is a manifestation to the failure of the institution of the state. We have institutions that are supposed to track and trade. We have institutions that are supposed to oversight. So that the allegation is coming out now. And some, you can say, have some one or two elements of connection. I don't want to say truth in it. That shows the failure of the institution of the Nigerian state. So when we begin to have good institutions, definitely you will know that there are some things you must not do. When you do it, definitely the institution will come for you. I think that for somebody to be applying for the job of a president, there should be some background check. Where is the DSS in terms of verifying the credentials of this candidate? Where is the security agency in terms of verifying the antecedents of this candidate? So it shows the failure of the institution. Nigeria institutions are not proactive. They are reactive. You need to um, push them a kick and start kind of system before they can function. And I think that is not good because you are leaving your responsibility to the average citizen. No, an agency like the EFCC should be able to track and trace where candidate leaves office if it is in the same time. Those in power, now immediately they leave office. They begin to track all what they've done in office and begin to see whether there are allegations of corruption. In China, it is not people that just come up and accuse. The institution itself track and trace and they find credible evidence against you. They pick you up. And before they pick you up, once they pick you up, you know you are in for a big job because you know they won't just pick you up for the fun of it. Another thing is the aspect of the citizen. When we begin to have oriented citizens, definitely politicians will be careful of what they do. If you know that you, you have an ambition, there's, there are some things you won't do because you know that the, the, the people, the electorate will come for you. But in a situation whereby the citizens are disoriented, they don't count these things as anything. In fact, there are some citizens that would like to vote for you based on your ability to steal. Because they know that it is when you steal that they can get one or two things from you. So we have citizens that they don't even like accountability. For example, I was in the Niger Delta for a research, and I happened to meet the aid of a top politician in Nigeria. And I asked the question that, why don't you tell your boss to at least do the hospital for these people? And the aide told me that if he builds the hospital, he may lose the election. That anytime he comes around, the people are satisfied with him distributing rights, giving them 1,000 1, error. So if you, have a, if you have citizens like that who are disoriented, who doesn't hold leaders to account, definitely you will live your life anyhow because you know that Nobody will hold you to account. So when actions, when there are consequences for action, definitely we begin to have a turnaround system. But as long as we have a system where anything goes, definitely we'll continue to have this kind of situation. Because right now, we, have, we operate a system in Nigeria that it is so easy for any kind of non-entity, any charlatan, any street touching, to aspire for any of the top offices. Because why? The requirement from the citizen is not high. It is easy for a candidate that has no specific manifesto, that has no specific plan, that has lived his life under the bridge, that has lived his life as a talk, as, a, as anything, to aspire for anything. And at the end of the day, where I have problem with the Nigerian citizen is that they now begin to cry. Now they have opportunity to choose, the power is in their hands, to choose who should govern them. If they don't choose wisely, at the end of the day, they will start complaining. So I think that the suffering over the years would have at least changed the old
reputation of Nigerians people they beat to be able to at least look at the credibility of their candidate. If you are taking your child to a school, you want to assess the quality of the teachers. You want to look at the school environment. If you want to rent an apartment, you want to look at the facilities available. If you want to select a spouse, you want to look out for some qualities. So why on earth would you want to elect a candidate and you are bothered, um, you are unbothered about the antecedent of that candidate? Why is the one that said, what a man so is shari? If you give your vote to somebody that you know, there are manifestations of incredibility, there are manifestations of health challenges, there are manifestations of corruption, don't come back and complain, just sleep with it. And if 24 hours is a long time in politics, the ruling for four years or eight years, as the case may be, is forever. Not even a long time. It's like forever. If 24 hours is a long time in politics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, Charles, <laughs> interesting things that uh, Deji has said. And we're still just wondering because all the time when we talk about the electorate, we talk about our political situation in Nigeria, we talk also about institutions most of the time. And I just wonder, is it that we don't have the institutions, we don't have the laws? Because the laws are there. For instance, if you go to the Constitution, Section 136 or thereabouts, it talks about the, the, the president. And it is clearly stated that if you become president, you cannot hold any other position that you know they, sh they could pay you for and all that. Our president, has been Minister of Petroleum. Since then, nobody even talks about it. But it's in the law. We also found this uh, problem of certificates last time with the president, the sitting president. We didn't know how that ended, but he's finishing his second tenure. So we just wonder, is it the absence of institutions? No, the institutions are there. The laws governing these institutions are there. Everything is in place in Nigeria. In fact, some people have said we have some of the best laws in the world. So if we, have, if we must address this issue, we should leave institutions as it were and, and talk about the individuals. But when we're talking about the individuals, the, the people of Nigeria, the question, like I asked Deji, is where do we start? Do we start from school? Do we start from family? Do we start from churches? Do we start from, I don't know. Where do we start? How do we do, go about it? Because it has to change. We can't keep blaming institutions and our laws because the laws are there. The institutions are there. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Wangu. The, 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 Wangu, you were correct that the institutions are there, but the institution is not the physical building. You talk about police as an institution, you're not talking about Louis Edith's house as the final arbiter, the seven-story building as the final arbiter of policing in the country. You're talking about who is the Inspector General of Police, how professional is he in his conduct, how unpatronizing is he to the political establishments, as it were. Where we should put all these blames on, first and foremost, even the corruption in these cases, uh, the fact that people defend corrupt individuals is on ethnicity. As an Igbo man, people expect, like I said in plus politics, that I should be okay with um, whatever a P2B as a candidate does. Even if his manifesto is not good because he's uh, accepted by everybody, uh, a lot of majority of Nigerians, because he's compared to Atiku and Tinubu, they will say, oh, this one is, uh, is a Jesus hanging between the two thieves. That is the kind of argument people from the scientists expect you to make. So they expect you to not to ask a lot of questions, not to scrutinize, to say, oh, there is nothing wrong with him having a foreign account and all of that. That is ethnicity as it speaks, and that has been the pain of Nigeria as it were today. The president of the Federal Republic, who is the petroleum minister, uh, somebody made a very funny post this morning on Facebook, uh, Mr. Wangu, and I think I should draw your attention to it. He said there are three important cues in this country now, but that one cue is the most important. He said there are, there are cues for PVC, which is the shortest cue now, that the other two cues are the longest. That is the cue for fuel and the cue for the, the cue for fuel and then the cue for um, the third was a uh, 
a queue for uh, Naira notes, that new Naira notes. So I said that among these three queues, the first, which is the PVC queues, which is the shortest, is the most important. And that people who prefer to go and queue for the other ones because they are also part of what makes life thrive. We have forgotten suddenly that Buhari is the petroleum minister and he is ordinarily supposed to relinquish that position now that the fuel queues have persisted since December till now. I think this is the longest fuel crisis we're having in this country. As an adult of 37 years standing, this is the longest time I have seen that there is even not, nobody is even talking about the irregularities in the fuel pump price. And the president is still sitting as the petroleum minister and the president combined, and the commander-in-chief. And as the commander-in-chief of the Federal Republic, he has unilaterally extended the tenure of the current inspector of police, Usman Baba, not on the basis or on the strength of his achievements in office or his expertise or his, inability, his ability to solve the security crisis that is plaguing this country, but because he's a full animal, it is as simple as that. It's the same ethnicity that I'm talking about that is the problem. So before you blame family, before you blame the churches, the mosques, the first thing you, pl you blame is ethnicity. Uh, the, the, the current IGP is his brother. There was a time they talked about, I said it in plus, on Plus Politics a few days ago, that there was a time it was in the news, uh, breaking news, that the commissioner of police for Kano State, for instance, has been deployed to Ebony, and the CP from Ebony was to go to another state. As we speak, Ali Ugaruba, who is a Fulani man from the same Katsina state and said to be related to the president, is still the commissioner of police in Ebony. That transfer could not work, even when it has, the, a signal had been sent, the media publicized it. Why? Because there is a Fulani hegemony in this country that tries to make you look stupid when you tell them that things are not going right. Whether things go right or wrong, they want their people to remain there and man all the important gates. And that is simply the reason why the institutions are not working, Mr. Wangu. So until we, 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 we get people who are sincere, who are looking at Nigeria as a national entity, not looking at the ethnic origin or their clannishness for their behaviors, we will never have a Nigeria that works. It is as simple as that. There is nothing else to blame. Going into the run up to the election, you have widespread insecurity. You still have bandits, banditry. You still have people's, uh, you know, hoodlums behaving people's heads. In a season where you're going into an election, you have any conflicts being attacked. And all of this is happening under a supposed inspector of police. And what he got for all of spirit, turning over all of this, was an extension of his tenure by the president. Because the constitution says it's his prerogative to, you know, appoint or disappoint the, 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 the IGP. So he has decided to extend his tenure based not on competence, not based on competence, but based on the patronage that he is his fellow Fulani brother. So, Mr. Wangu, we, we, we cannot say we don't know where the problem is coming from. The problem is coming from ethnicity. Like I've said it in this program, I said it uh, the other day on Politics Today, that people did not expect, people expected, I would say, oh, that everything with Peter Beast manifesto is right. I said, no, it's not true. He, did, he was also vague, like other candidates on security. I said, until you, until you isolate the states, 36 states of the Federation and the FCT, and treat the peculiarities of the security challenges, and know that in the southeast, for instance, in a state like Ebony and Imo, the problem is a Mubago, a militia formed by the government of the days in these two APC states to terrorize oppositions. You cannot just say, oh, the problem of the South is just IPOB. What Ebubago has done and killed in Ebony and Demo is more than all the pockets of crisis that is associated or related to the IPOB. These are areas are expected that the four contending, major contenders, frontliners in this presidential race to sit down and itemize and say, oh, in the Southeast, we are not just saying we are going to fight IPOB. We are also going to tackle this menace of militia formed by the government of the day for their own political interests.
to further offend their own politicalness. Until we are that sincere, adroitly sincere as a people, we are going nowhere. You will keep running around and will keep seeing people who will defend people for corruption, who will defend that Tiku because he's a fellow Kulani brother and he's from their state and he's from their zone. We will keep having Yoruba who are defending Tinubu, not minding all the allegations against him because he's a fellow Yoruba man and it is his turn according to them. So until these kind of narratives are pushed aside and people now begin to ask people to account based on national interest, based on what will be good for everybody, we are going to have this cycle again, coming back again after four years to complain. That is my submission. All right, uh, Mr. Deji, let me direct the same question to you, but then let me put it this way. Is it, is, it the, is it strong systems that we need or strong men to direct the systems? Mm -hmm. Because uh, it, it, they, they are intertwined. Yeah. They work hand in hand. And, you know, while Nyamgu was speaking earlier, he mentioned how that, you know, asking whether we should blame the family. Is it the educational system? Who should be held accountable? You know, it still boils down to the question of accountability. Mr. Charles has gone on to mention a lot of allegations that have been thrown in the past, some of which are playing out now. They are no longer allegations. We are seeing it happening before our very eyes. For a very good example is the president being the president and still being the minister of petroleum. Who is holding who accountable? And how do we begin to nip this issue in the board? Well, I think we need um, strong institutions instead of strong men because the institution of the state remains so long as there is no rapture. The Nigerian state will remain for as long as possible. But if we have a strong man, what happens if the man dies? So the state remains for as long as possible. In the next 100 years, the Nigerian state has high probability of remaining. We would have definitely gone. All of us. That's certain. So if I'm the strong man, manning the institution, for example, what's going to happen if I'm gone? But if we have a system whereby you cannot maneuver your way wrongly, you cannot breach the system, you cannot play the system, then we begin to have people that will live according to the dictates of the law. That is what I believe. Because man likes to be free. It's the, it is in the nature of man to be free. By man, in this case, I mean human beings. Human beings cherish freedom. If a man doesn't have money and he sees you with so much money, he naturally likes to be free to take your money. A man likes to work at any time, regardless of coffee or anything. So if you have something that another person doesn't have, the person has stronger power, stronger mind, or weapon, we naturally like to take it. But if there are strong institutions and you know that once you commit, you must pay, or to commit an offense or a crime, you must pay for it, definitely people will begin to live their life credibly. So if we have strong men, strong men is just a person. And at the end of the day, the institution will go the way of the strong man based on his ideology, based on his philosophy, his outlook. Sadly, no institution can go beyond the vision, the initiative of his leader, the initiative of the number one person. Nigeria cannot go beyond the knowledge of Wari at the moment. Because even if you go to him and you say, oh, Mr. President, let's twist this way. He has the prerogative to either accept or decline. And so long as he has that prerogative, he will use it for or against, as the case may be, or as he so wishes. So I think that we have been strong institution. For example, if Nigeria were to be the, the United States, 
during the um, election of Donald Trump and Joe Biden, it would have been easy for a president like Donald Trump in Nigeria to command the armed forces to do an, to an undo. In Nigeria, we have a command and control system. If a policeman arrests you, the policeman doesn't know the law. He will, he will walk based on what his boss has said. If a military man, if the boss of a military man says shoot, the military man, that soldier, that rank and file, will shoot you first before thinking of the law. Because at that point in time, the words of his boss is the law. So, such, such a system will just make life short, nasty, and brutish. Would that be a system whereby man will come and go and will leave the way he so pleases, will run the instrument of state the way it will be? If we have strong and credible institutions, definitely the president will appoint the head of security agency from one ethnic group. The writers of the Nigerian Constitution had, did not foresee that somebody would become a president and decide to appoint the head of security agencies from just one ethnic group. I feel he is affiliated with. Else, they would have made it, they, they would have institution, institutionalized it in the Constitution that if you are to become a president, you must appoint press, you, you, you must appoint head of security agency from different ethnic groups. Just unlike if it hadn't been in the constitution that you must appoint minister from Pacific State of the Federation. Okay. Maybe we have a system now whereby maybe ten ministers we from we come from Castina, the president's home state, where TSS was to recruit still talking about the effectiveness of the institution rather than building strong human beings. When the TSS was to recruit at some point in time, we have this influx of people from a particular section of the country, and some sections were being denied. When the federal government was to acquire a loan at some point, and they like enumerate how the loans will be spent, it remarkably favors a section of the country than the other. That shows that if we have strong men, definitely in a country that ethnicity, religion, regionalization plays a major role, definitely we won't okay. move forward. So what we need is All strong right. institutions that will bring you to account, no matter who you are, even if you believe in, in ethnicism, even if you, you believe in ethnocentrism, even if you believe in orientalism, you cannot walk beyond what is stipulated. And us, you go beyond it, you know you, are, you will pay for it. Okay, so Shola. To have to All right, Shola. We will move forward as a country. Uh, thank you very much, Shola. Um, maybe this is a case of um, the egg and the, the chicken, which one came first? Mm. Uh, because this argument will go back and forth all the time. But um, we'd like to thank you, gentlemen, uh, for giving us your thoughts, especially now that we know that there are three Qs, PVC Q, a fuel Q, and uh, I jotted it down, and um, fuel scarcity uh, uh, Q. <laughs> New Naira so, note. New Naira note, sorry, Naira yes. Note. So we should make sure that the, f the first one, which is the shortest one, becomes the longest one because, because it's, it's the most important, the most important one. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank for you. Thank okay. you for having me too. Good to hear the year, as always. You're thank, welcome. Thank you. thank you so much. Okay, we will take a break now because we'll bring you the news. When we return, um, we finish on these issues and more uh, that we have uh, on our list, as it were. Stay with us. You're welcome back. It's still the run-up, and we're just trying to wrap up and give some announcements, as it were, if that's what we'll call it, and just uh, go back to what we're saying today. Our topic of discussion was really all of the... Um, how do we call it in Nigeria now? The rants <laughs> going on <laughs> in the political space between parties, especially the um, the leading political parties. I and mean, we're talking about institutions and the individuals. And mm -hmm. one of the guests was saying that we need institutions and not individuals. And I'm just wondering, who makes the institution to work? Because if the laws are there, 
Um, I'm not even talking about the buildings like one of them said, but the laws are there. Everything that should guide that institution, they are all there. But the people who are in charge, or even the ones who are following, are not ready to stick to them. So how will the institution work when the people do not want it to work? Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, like I said, maybe it's a case of the egg and the chicken, which one came first. I don't know how that argument will be. But do you buy the fact that I, I it has to that, be I hope that we, I hope that we get to the point. Uh, uh, Deji, he was the person yes. you know, making that point. And I, I can feel where he's coming from. You know how that what we need are strong institutions and not strong individuals, uh, because uh, while you might want to argue that it is still individuals who work in these institutions, but then if you strengthen the institution by way of constitution, by way of rules and regulations, by way of or patterns of doing things, and then the individuals in these institutions are supposed to follow through. Mm. It's not rocket science. If I people mean, ju if people just, just would do the right thing, every, but then we have people. We have a uh, a society that has collapsed so much that nobody wants to be held accountable. Because when you say people should just follow, and who doesn't follow, what happens to the person? That's it. That's Nobody's the thing. asking questions. Because now, let me give you an instance. It is a good thing to do to keep to time, for instance. Mm. And then you sit, you, you have a meeting, it, and then you tell yourself that the meeting is supposed to be at uh, 2 o'clock. We just put it there so that we know that people will come at 4. It's, I mean, who are you telling? Exactly. You that is a to? very typical example. So, I mean, they say it's Nigerian, Nigerian time. time. <laughs> Africa <laughs> time. created Nigerian so, time. So, so when you talk about institutions, it's like, okay, time. Time waits, waits for no one. It's there. It's constant. It's moving. Whether you like it or not, it's moving. You are the one to make it work. And you just say, let's, let's buy a better watch or a better <laughs> clock. Or I, I don't know what it, it is. It, it Even if you bring Big Ben, mm. you will still not keep to time if of you course. don't want to keep to time. Of course. That's what is happening in Nigeria. So we need to change the mindset of the people. And talking about mindset, we just heard this morning that the uh, Balogu market um, burned. And that is not my, really my problem, even though I, my heart goes to the people who have lost their goods and all that. It's almost like a yearly ritual now. But what, that, what came to my mind when I heard about the fire incident was the fact that Nigerians don't even want to give room for fire service trucks to move. So if you go to Balogu Market, I'm very sure that you will not find a space that the fire trucks will move mm. to, to fight the fire if it Apart happens. Apart from the traffic on yes. the road, the, the stalls are so packed together, you can barely move. You can't The move. human traffic alone. I'm not talking about vehicles. Oh dear. Human traffic. I mean, how do you, if I ever have to go to Balogu Market, I would have sat down for hours mm. and motivate myself. <laughs> do you understand? Like, give myself enough reason mm -hmm. I should be there. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And then when you have situations like this and the fire comes, how do you even... It, it will engulf everybody because yeah. everybody is close together. We're just, we're just lucky that, you know, uh, sometimes these things happen and the casualties we find, sometimes we don't find human casualties, mm. but um, sometimes we do. But... but if the way we build our houses, the, our own attitude towards safety and all that is taken into consideration, I think it's just God that is keeping us in, in this country. And then we, are, we, are, we were glad the other day when we heard that the president set up a committee to look into the fuel issue to make sure that the distribution is, is going on smoothly and there's no longer scarcity. So far, we haven't felt the impact. Mm -hmm. I hope the Minister for Petroleum and then the chairman, <laughs> chairman of this committee, of the, the same person committee, and yes. the president, would do something really, really urgently to make sure that this fuel crisis is solved. Otherwise, well, bottom line is, they say there are three queues now, PVC, Naira notes, and uh, fuel queues. And, and let's talk about the new Naira notes. Uh, the central bank governor has said there is no going back. The yeah, January even the, 30th, the, the president said Yeah, so the well. January 30th deadline still stands. Uh, the ATM machines are still dispensing old notes. There are almost uh, the, the ratio of the new Naira notes to the old Naira notes in the market are now there. Is you can't compare. Worst of all is that even if they dispense the new notes, no ATM 
is dispensing 200 Naira notes. And 200 Naira is like the focal point when it comes to giving change. You mm -hmm. enter a vehicle, you need change, and 200 Naira will be a part of it. You, enter, you buy something, and 200 Naira is a part. And we don't find 200 Naira I'm anywhere. really hoping that it be... I, how, do, how do they intend to do it? I'm really hoping that they have another plan up their sleeves, because even when you go to the counter mm -hmm. to withdraw money, they still give you the old Naira notes. You go to the ATM machines, they still give you the old narrow notes. POS operatives complain of the same thing when they go to withdraw, when they go to, um, yeah, withdraw. They still get the old narrow notes. So now, now that they have said that there are sanctions from the CBN to all the banks, if they don't dispense uh, new narrow notes, a lot of banks have shut down their ATMs. They say they, they don't have the sufficient narrow notes, new narrow notes to put in their ATMs. So we will be the ones to suffer now. And we have just four days left or... Four days, yes, because so on the 29th, a lot of people will stop collecting. Because mm -hmm. right now, we heard the other story that one family <laughs> <laughs> refused to collect bright price that were paid in, in that was paid in, in old, old Naira, Naira notes. notes. So that was like last week. Or and you, and you week. have companies and, and institutions and marketers telling you that in this shop, we don't collect old Naira mm -hmm. notes. How? Mm -hmm. how? How? Well, how, how would you even blame them? Because when they collected... Can they, do they even have the time to go to the bank and deposit it? Do, we, do they, I don't, I oh mean, the problems are many, but we're hoping that uh, we are going to find a solution to our problems one day. Mm. PVC collection will also end on the 30th, and do your best to make sure that you collect it. We say kudos to the people, on the, the governors. On yeah, well, PVC collections. Be, oh, okay. Um, we say kudos to the governors and all the relevant people who said that, who gave out some days for mm. the collection of PVC. We hope that that will also improve it. Thank you for being a part of our show today. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. Let's do it again tomorrow. And my name is Uchechuku Onodo. Go get your PVC.